We'll start out at the very start. So we've got this word symposium. And when you hear the word symposium, what comes to mind? Because it means something very different today than it, it used to back in, in the time that, that Plato was writing about. So, yeah. A group of people getting together for a common goal. Okay, yeah, that's, that's, that's at the, the core of it, getting together. The, the sum is the sin, you know, that we have. That's what happens when you put it in front of a P, it goes to sum. Um, usually, if we talk about a symposium or symposia, um, what are people getting together to do? Well, that's what they did in Plato's time, drink. But we don't say, I, I, I'd like to have a symposium. Would you stop by my place at six o'clock and bring, you know, a six pack or you know, a bottle of wine? We don't we don't say stuff like that usually. If I invite you to a symposium, what am I probably inviting you to? Like a presentation of like people sharing information. Yeah, there'll usually be probably a panel up in front and you'll sit out there in chairs sort of like these, but they'll be more comfortable, be in a nicer room, and they'll talk about something. Maybe it's about you know, whether we should go to war with Syria, I and mean, you'll have like, you know, 10 experts. That would be unbearable though, 10. You know, maybe three or four experts. And each of them will give their, their you know, their take on it. And then maybe they'll argue with each other and they'll field some, some questions from the audience. There won't be any drinking until after <coughs> the event, most likely. Uh, some people might have flasks. That might actually help you get through some symposia. Um, so you might wonder, well, that doesn't sound anything like what's going on in Plato's thing. How did we end up with things where they are today? And you know, some of that is the, the long history of this term, symposium. Um, Plato changed it in a way. Because um, symposium originally means drinking party, the, the getting together. And this, this word posium, we get the word potable from that. Potable, mean, potable means drinkable, like potable water. And it comes from the, the verb to drink. So this is a, a time for them to get together and drink uh, wine in some big cups. They didn't have uh, beer at the time. They had a few other things. And, um, you know, what else do people like to do when they're drinking? They had music. You notice they have to send away a flute girl uh, who was going to be playing during the thing. What else do people like to do when they drink? your experience. Yeah, and they have a big dinner beforehand. You can probably imagine they're still going to have snacks around, um, you know, in case anybody gets hungry halfway through the night. And they're laying down on couches. The Greeks and uh, the Romans also didn't necessarily eat sitting. They often, they often ate laying down. It was a more relaxed kind of thing. Um, they're sitting together on the couches. You know, they're, they're, they're big enough that they can share. And they're just hanging out. And why aren't they going to do heavy drinking in this, this case? They're trying to have like a serious conversation. Well, that's putting a nice face on it. Yeah. Um, that's not the original origin of it. Um, yeah. They're still hogging over from the last one. Exactly. They drank so hard at the, the celebration the day before. Because this guy, Agathon, whose house the symposium is being held at, he just won a major contest. He is a playwright. He's a, tra uh, a tragedy writer. So, you know, maybe you read Aeschylus or Sophocles or Euripides when, when you were in, in high school or who knows, middle school, depending on where you went. Maybe you'll read them here. Those are Greek tragedies. Agathon is coming after those guys. He's younger than them. And they had contests every year for writing tragedies and putting these tragedies on. He won. Yeah. Is this kind of like. Um, one of those, I guess, parties where philosophers like come together and they discuss a really important topic and they get really drunk and, and their drunken state validate what they said. Or like well, so you're asking a couple different <coughs> questions. Not all these guys are philosophers. The only one who's really a professional philosopher is Socrates. Or like poets or writers. Yeah, like intellectuals. Yeah, um, yeah you, that's a good way to put it. These are all people who are part of the Greek, the Athenian upper class. They're, they're leisured. They're able to devote their time to things like writing comedies, writing tragedies. Um, one of them's a doctor. 
Um, one of them is a legal expert. Alcibiades bursts in at the end, and he, he actually becomes a general later on. Um, now, whether, what they, whether they're drinking hard to, to sort of validate what they're saying, no. As a matter of fact, once they actually start drinking hard again, the party, the, the intellectual stuff is over. And it just turns into a, a fun hangout. Everything goes. There, there are some guys at the end of the night still arguing with each other. The three last men standing. Agathon, Aristophanes, and Socrates. And he's arguing with them about their, their particular crafts. Can the same person write comedy like Aristophanes does and tragedy like Agathon does? Because um, both of them are specialists. And the guy who I actually studied with, his suggestion with that is, is yes. And Plato is the person who actually does write both of those in the symposium. But that's, that's a whole different issue. Um, so yeah, they, to go back to it, they're, they're, they're really hung over. They drank hard. They partied the, the night before. And they're just not up to, <laughs> that tells you how much these guys drink. They're not up to another night of heavy drinking. Um, the thought does not, does not move them. Normally, these guys would like to do that. And everybody there, except for Socrates, tends to get drunk. Socrates can do whatever he wants, and he's not really affected by it. He's got a weird kind of constitution. Um, now, they've also got that doctor there. And the doctor does tell them, you know, it's not really good for you to drink so much. I, I always counsel moderation. So they say, OK, if we're not going to drink, what are we going to do? That's why they start coming up with this notion of giving speeches. It's not like they said, hey, let's get together for the book club over here, and we're going to talk about ideas. Originally, it starts out, we're going to, we're going to celebrate. We're going to party. And then if we're not going to drink, well, how should we fill up the night? Well, let's talk about stuff. And what should we talk about? Then this suggestion comes up, let's talk about love. Why? What's, what's so important about that? I mean, people are interested in it, right? But why do they end up talking about it? Because nobody's done it before. Nobody's given a speech in praise of love. People have praised all sorts of other things, um, even down to like talking about different kinds of salt and what their properties are. You know, the Greeks are into cooking. So, um, but nobody up until this point has really told us why love is such a great thing. So that's an interesting philosophical topic. And then it rolls on from there. Let me back up a little bit, though. One of the things that I want to call your attention to, because it shows you the, the craft work going into this, is what we call uh, narrative structure. Now, during the night, we're going to get speeches. And there is really, let me see if I can fit all this on here. There's a sequence of uh, one, two, three, four, five, another one over here, six, and then Alcibiades bringing up the rear. So each person is going to take up a block of time and talk about love. Alcibiades is actually going to talk about his love for Socrates and what kind of a swell guy Socrates is. and So he's a little bit off topic, but that's okay because he, he crashed the party. He wasn't there at the start, so he didn't hear all these other speeches. These other speeches kind of build off of each other. Um, and that's the core of the dialogue. But is that where the dialogue begins? No. Starts out with this guy, um, Polydorus, talking with somebody else who we don't even know, some unnamed companion. And then he says, yeah, I was just talking with Glaucon about this. So there's kind of a nesting here. We've got Apollodorus <coughs> and Glaucon. By the way, Glaucon is Plato's brother. Um, Glaucon shows up in a couple dialogues. Plato never puts himself into a dialogue. The I in the dialogue is always somebody else, usually Socrates. <coughs> In this case, it's Apollodorus, and he's telling the story. And when did this actually take place? Many years before. This is the, you know, this is at uh, Agathon's 
party. And so that happened when we were boys. You know, Glaucon, you thought this happened last week? No, this happened a long time ago. And so where did Apollodorus hear this from? He heard it ultimately from this guy, there's the Demas, who then told it to another guy, and that guy told it to Apollodorus, and Apollodorus thought that things were kind of hazy, so he checked in with Socrates about this. So this is sort of like you hearing about something that happened in your family before you were born, and then going around to your aunts and uncles and grandparents and great aunts and great uncles and, and asking, did my dad actually say that? Because that doesn't sound like him at all. Or, you know, how did they meet again? What's, what's the backstory on this? Um, sometimes those things can be kind of surprising, can't they? Have any of you ever done that in your family? You know, find out that, that uh, people had a very different life than, than you, you know, come to associate them with? Well, Aristodemus was actually there. Now, does Aristodemus do a lot of talking? Not much. He doesn't give a speech. He's, he's a guy who likes to hang out with Socrates all the time. And he meets up with Socrates. He's not actually invited to the party, um, although it turns out Agathon did want to invite him, didn't he? Um, he just, you know, didn't know where he was at the time. And they didn't have text messaging or, you know, anything like that back then. So Aristodemus goes along. Socrates actually ends up lagging behind because he does what Socrates typically does. He gets lost in thought. Starts, you know, trying to work out some sort of puzzle and he stays back there. Then he finally shows up about halfway through the dinner. And things don't get really rolling until Socrates shows up. Then they, they have the, you know, should we drink some? Should we not drink? And they decide, no, we're not going to drink. And now what we're going to do instead is give speeches. Phaedrus will go first, then Pausanias. Then it's supposed to be somebody who doesn't go next. Who's supposed to go next? Does anyone remember? Who actually goes fourth? <coughs> he's, the, he's the comedian. Aristophanes. And so the doctor... Uh, Eric Symmachus. Eric Symmachus goes next. And then Agathon. And then Socrates. And then Alcibiades. And then after that point, other people break in. They're all drunk. I mean, Alcibiades is, you know, stone cold drunk himself when he's delivering his speech. He's, he's complaining about it. Um, these other people burst in, and the, the intention of having a night where they're not going to drink hard, and they're just going to talk about stuff like completely goes out the window, and everybody's drinking and doing all sorts of stuff, and then everybody's either passed out at the end of the night or over at that table, the last three guys who are, who are you know, talking, and you can imagine them you know, probably slurring their words. It's, you know, uh, the sun has just come up, um, Socrates then gets up and goes about his business, not affected by anything. The rest of the people are probably the worst for wear. Yeah. Oh, no. Oh, okay. So, this is the basic structure. Now, there's something special going on in Socrates' speech. This is something we want to be attentive to as well. How is his speech different than everybody else's? Because this is really where the climax of the dialogue takes place. Let me put it to you this way. So we have a story within a story. What happens when Socrates starts talking? After he gets done, you know, going back and forth with Agathon, question and answer. Going from Apollodorus and Glaucon to this party where, you know, dropping 20 years going back in time. What happens when Socrates starts telling his stories? He goes back in time too, doesn't he? At the time that the party's taking place, he's a middle-aged man. Because uh, he's an old man when he dies. How is he, oh, somebody, have, how is he when he's telling a story about the Otomans? 
he's a young guy, like Phaedrus, or perhaps Pausanias. Eric Simicus is probably a middle age. Agathon is pretty young. Alcibiades are young. Socrates is saying, you know, back when I was your age, I knew this really brilliant woman. She taught me everything about love. Here's what she actually had to say to me. So there's a story within a story within a story. That's the narrative structure of this, this entire thing, um, sort of mapped out. Now, each one of these characters represents a certain kind of person, a certain kind of approach to the big questions about love. You, you're right, they're all intellectuals, they're all people getting together, and they all have different perspectives, don't they? Phaedrus is a little bit hard to pin down, but he's a young guy. His, his uh, profession, his character is not really set. Pausanias, he's the law and order guy. He wants to talk about what's you know, right and wrong and what ought to be the case and how to tell things apart. <coughs> Eric Simicus, he's a practicing doctor, so he knows something about the science of his time. And he looks at everything in a sort of scientific, medical uh, point of view. Um, he uses the terminology of ancient medicine. Pausanias uses the terminology of ancient legal Endeavors. Aristophanes is an actually existing, per these, these are all actual people, but Aristophanes is somebody who we know about independently because he left behind plays that if you want to, you can actually read. Aristophanes was one of the kings of comedy of his time. Um, he, was, he was one of the people who represented what they call the old comedy. And the old comedy was very raw stuff. Um, just to give you an idea about how, how silly some of this was, on the stage, um, the actors would get on, and they had these, you know, these, these comedic masks, so you couldn't actually see their face. But they also wore um, giant phalluses that they would walk around with while they're talking to, to each other. That's kind of a funny image, isn't it? Imagine people now, you know, you're reading a play. Got to picture people actually talking to each other this way because it was all about like just, you know goofy stuff. And, and they would pick on, as opposed to the, the, the new comedy, which is more like sitcoms. You guys are all familiar with sitcoms. Um, you know, they started in the, what, the 50s with, with us with TV, and we have them going on today. Like, what are some popular sitcoms today? Um, as opposed to dramas, or sometimes they call them situation comedies. You know, they're not sketch comedies where the characters are different. They're the same characters over and over again. Like one of the ones I, I particularly like, a particularly raw one, it's always sunny in Philadelphia. Um, that's a situation comedy. The characters don't develop, they don't learn anything, they don't change, become better people. They just do the, the stupid things that they tend to do. And Max is a particular kind of stupid, Dennis is a whole different kind of stupid, D is a different kind of stupid. They do their stupid things, and we laugh at it. Um, and that's kind of shock compared to old comedy. Old comedy would actually target people. It would say, you. They actually had a part of the, the play where the actors would step down from the stage, take the masks off, and go out into the audience and yell at people, harangue them, politicians, other playwrights, famous people. They would target people. Socrates himself is targeted in one of Aristophanes' plays called the, the Clouds, as being this you know goofy, tells everybody everything they want to hear kind of kind of snake oil salesman. Yeah, you had a question. Yeah, I was going to ask if he wrote the Clouds because he did. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and Plato references that in this in a sort of hidden way. Um, Socrates mentions it at one point. He also mentions it later in another dialogue called the Apology. Um, Plato is, is imitating Aristophanes. He's putting him into the play, into his own play. And he has Aristophanes tell the kind of stories that Aristophanes likes to do. You know, this big thing about, well, in the beginning, we were these round, you know, four-legged, four-armed creatures that also, you know, two sets of, of reproductive parts. And then we messed with the gods, and the gods, you know, cut us right down the middle, just like, you know, cutting a, an egg with a hair is one of the, the metaphors that he has. Um, that's typical Aristophanes. And it's pretty funny when you, when you look at it. Agathon is 
what would you think to be the high point of the, the dialogue? I mean, we're here celebrating this guy's triumph, his, his uh, beating all the other playwrights in this contest. Now, it, it, uh, tragedy was a big production. You know, this is not comedy where we just have you know some laughs and a good time. This is supposed to elevate us. This is supposed to make us think about big things, about our own mortality, about the nature of fate and love, and you know, the right life and the wrong life, um, blindness and and you know, perceptiveness. All these sorts of you know big picture things, and it had to be in in particularly elevated language. And the, tra the, the tragedy writer was sort of like not just a writer, but also a producer. They had to oversee this whole production. And so he's, he's done that. He's going to give a speech that reflects the kind of guy that he is. And he's, Plato is actually parodying um, some of the, the rhetoricians, some of the orators of his time, and particularly Gorgias, who he names. Socrates gets up. Socrates says, I can't give a speech. But, you know, I, I thought I was up to it, but then I hear these guys, and these are some real you know, talkers. I, I'm not that kind of guy. If you want, I can do the sort of thing that I do every day. You guys all know me. I like to ask people questions, and we talk about stuff. I can do that, but I can't do this, this you know, giving a big worked out articulate speech. Is that okay with you? And they say, yeah, that, that's, that's fine. And so what does he do? Um, now remember, whose party is this? It's Agathon's, right? Agathon just gave the best speech. What does Socrates do? Tears it apart. Turns out Agathon didn't know what he was talking about. That's kind of bad manners, isn't it? But that, that's typical Socrates. Um, and, and Plato's not pulling any punches with this. And then Socrates tells this, this story about somebody else, somebody who's not at the party, somebody who's probably died a long time ago. The only actual woman philosopher in the story <coughs> is this person, Diodema, who nobody knows you know, whether she truly existed or not, or whether Plato um, you know, created her as a character. But she actually gets the, the best lines, doesn't she? She gets to tell you, here's the real story. Everything else that these guys have been saying is not completely wrong, but it's all pretty one-sided. They missed what it's really about. And so she tells that story. This guy Alcibiades, I mentioned, he eventually becomes a general. Um, he is sort of the typical golden boy of ancient Athens. He's rich, good-looking, strong, bold. Everybody's in love with him. You know, everybody wants to either, you know, be him or sleep with him or be friends with him. Um, very undisciplined, though. He has, he, has, he has no control over his appetites, in part because everybody gives him what he wants. And he ends up having a really tragic end much later on. He ends up betraying his city, Athens, going to Sparta, betraying Sparta in part by sleeping with people he's not supposed to sleep with going to Persia, which was the traditional enemy of the Greeks, so now he's like a double traitor, and then while he's in Persia, even manages to betray them. Um, so, you, you know, this is sort of foreshadowed in, in, in his character and how he acts. He tells you, um, when I'm around Socrates, I want to be the best guy that I possibly can, but I'm not able to, to sustain it. I'm not able to keep it up. But he gives you this really interesting speech about who this guy Socrates is. And what is so attractive about this short, fat, pug-nosed, you know, balding, old guy that all these other people want to hang out with him? Who, by the way, is not rich, doesn't have any political connections, can't set you up with anything, um, will drink, you know, all the wine that you give him, and doesn't, you know, doesn't really care about too much when it comes to physical things. What's so attractive about this guy? That's what we'll get to at the end. So there you have sort of, you know, in a, in a thumbnail, all the things that are going on in the speech. Now, let's actually zero in on this guy's speech, Phaedrus. 
So Phaedra starts out, and oh, one one thing too, I, I I did say I was going to talk about this, and I'm going to try to cover this very quickly. So these these Greek guys are talking a lot about love, and you notice first off, um, a lot of the time they're talking about love between men, and they don't just mean like you know being being buddies or bros. They mean some you know some actual sexual relationships in, in some cases. Um, this kind of goes to that question about platonic love. Um, Plato doesn't go for that sort of thing, but he has characters who do, in part because a lot of the ancient Greeks did. Pausanias, by the way, is saying no, you shouldn't do that yeah, early on in his speech as well. Um, so there's that aspect. They didn't see any sort of inherent contradiction between that and, say, living a married life, in part because um, it was understood that if you were a member of, of, you know, especially Athenian society, you needed to produce new citizens. That was your duty, not only to, you know, um, say, your partner or your wife in the marriage, or to your family. It was your duty to the, the state, the society. Not least because if you actually were a member of the property class, you were part of the army. The, the survival of the city depended on citizens being there and reproducing in every generation. So the, the ancient Greeks didn't see a huge conflict in many cases between what we would call homosexual relationships and heterosexual relationships. Does that mean they were all bi? No, I mean, they, they had different temperaments. Some of them talk about um, being interested in men, some talk about being interested in women. Uh, the biggest issue that they seem to be concerned about is, you know, is the person that they're trying to pursue or sleep with the kind of person that they ought to be pursuing? So they're very concerned about, you know, people sleeping with each other's spouses. That's a big no-no. And again, in ancient societies, adultery was not just seen as a personal offense. It was seen as, you know, a state offense. You were actually undermining society by doing that. Um, in ancient Athens, women were more or less confined to the home, with a few exceptions. You notice Diodema is a priestess, right? Um, working class women, of course, had to work outside of the home. And slaves, you know, they had a big slave society of both male and female slaves. None of this applied to them. Um, you got some working girls, like the flute girl. Um, but for the most part, women were confined to, to the domestic sphere. Um, and so what that meant was that if men were going to have relationships in which they would talk about things like politics or commerce, it was going to have to be with other men. So, you know, and we can, we can worry about whether this was you know, wrong or unequal or stuff like that. I want to put those questions aside and just focus on what things were like so that we can understand the text. The other thing we want to think about is this uh, older, younger, uh, relationship. Um, the Greeks, depending on, on which part of Greece you're in, uh, had different attitudes about um, love relationships, romantic relationships, and even sexual relationships between men and younger men or even boys. And so you see this talked about quite a bit in there. You notice that even in this, this uh, this symposium, there's some very different attitudes expressed, right? Posanius says, yeah, people do that sort of thing, but you shouldn't be doing that. And he's got kind of a strange justification for it, as we'll see. Did you have a question? Or were you just stretching? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, could men marry each other in ancient Greece? Or? No. No. no, they could live together as companions if they wanted to. Um, but no, marriage was understood as, essentially, the relationship that, that you know binds uh, male and female together, produces progeny. You could fall in love, but that wasn't necessarily expected. Um, as a matter of fact, you know, you might not have that much in common with the person that you marry, because a lot of marriages were in fact arranged as relationships between between uh, houses. You know. So Socrates had a wife uh, <laughs> who uh, he put out a he you know she may be very unfairly portrayed by Plato. She's portrayed as being very nagging and mean to him. 
Um, and he said that he married her in part because if he could put up with her, he could put up with anybody. Um, so there's not a lot of love in that relationship unless love means something like enduring somebody else's BS. Um, now, on her part, she put up with a lot of stuff too. You got this guy Socrates, who instead of actually working for a living and taking you know, what his, his parents have handed down to him, goes around town just getting in random conversations with people about all sorts of stuff and eventually gets himself killed as a result. Um, so it wasn't a uh, you know, rose garden for her either. So anyway, <clears throat> this is all stuff to, to keep in mind when we're looking at these Greek conceptions of love. I think it's very helpful if we try to transpose a lot of this into categories that we're interested in and more familiar with. So I think that you know, we don't necessarily have to be confined to thinking just of, um, you know, older man, younger man. We can think of this in terms of any sort of situation where there's an older lover and a younger lover. You know, we can ask ourselves questions like, well, you know, what if somebody who's 14 falls in love with somebody who's 30? You know, could that be a good relationship, regardless of sex? You know, you know whether they're uh, both men, both women, male, female, you know, older, older male, older female. <clears throat> These sort of things can be, can be generalized. We're not stuck necessarily with reading it just with what Plato put on the table, I think. Um, I, I find that, you know, makes the text a bit more, more interesting. Well, let's start with this guy, Phaedrus. So, um, What's the first thing he says about love? It's great to be in love. It's wonderful. He says, love is old. Love is very, very, very old. And you might say, well, that's a weird way to start. Why, do, why does he care about that? Well, you know, for ancient people, uh, and this still goes for a lot of cultures, Antiquity is a sign of greatness, a sign of being closer to the origins of things. Um, we often, we moderns often tend to devalue the old and say the new, the new is the best thing. You know, so for example, so much better than my iPhone 3, you know, this new iPhone 5. It is faster, it can do a lot more stuff. Um, when it comes to technology, the newer probably is better. but. When it comes to some other things, because not everything's technology, maybe the older really is at times better. The ancient Greeks certainly thought that if you're closer to the origin of things, that you're more powerful, you're, you have a greater dignity, you matter more. Um, you know, we, we have attitudes sort of like that. You know, think about our monuments and museums and the reverence in which the, the Constitution is held, you know, uh, which just ga you know gains a bit more. People disagree about what it means, but it gains a bit more every year because <clears throat> we have this long, you know, ancient past to look back upon that none of us can remember, of course, because we weren't alive. Even our grandparents weren't alive. Um, so there's something to that. Now he doesn't stop there. Love is is very old, but love is also here. We start getting to more substantive stuff. High is good. Love is the best thing of all. Why? I mean, money's nice, isn't it? If you have to decide, love or money, <coughs> sometimes money's the better thing to have. Maybe not for your whole life, but certainly in some cases. Or if you're really hungry, food. You know, I, If I'm really, really hungry, I don't care if you love me or not. I, I want to eat, and if you give me a hamburger, I'll be, you know, I'll be your friend. Um, you know, we could run down a whole list of other goods. Sometimes sleep, you know, if I could just get to sleep. Um, that doesn't last too long, thankfully, but you, you get the idea. So love is the highest good. Um, how, do, how do we know this to be the case? Well, here he makes a kind of argument. How do we know love is the highest good? What does love do for us that um, lets us say this sort of thing? Love 
lets us look at things in a different way. It makes us conscious of something. What does Phaedrus think, think it makes us conscious of? Let's, let's sort of sketch the picture out. You've all been infatuated with something at one point or another, right? Now, I, I could ask you, how do you feel when you're around that person? Well, I've got butterflies in my stomach, I'm nervous, you know, I'm clumsy, that sort of thing. But what are you really worried about? It's not like, you know, I'm going to drop my cup and then, you know, a little coffee will spill and I'll look like a doofus. Yeah. Yeah. We're concerned with... the opinion of the lover or the beloved, depending on which side we're on in the relationship. If we're the, if we're the one that, that is being loved by somebody else, then we feel like we have to measure up to them. In this case, you could think about like you know parents and, and, and children, but he actually says parents, you know, that that sort of dynamic is not as strong as the loved lover dynamic. When somebody actually loves us in a romantic way, we're sort of on our toes. We don't want to disappoint them. And what if we're infatuated with somebody else? We really don't want to disappoint them. We want to appear to be the best person that we are. And this leads to a lot of problems on dates, doesn't it? You know, when people have to, you know, put on a different kind of face than they normally have. There's always, you know, here's, here's a common quandary. You take your date out to some restaurant and maybe a show in town, and now you pass a homeless person. Now, you've got your own you know, way of dealing with homeless people already, and this is, a, this is somebody panhandling, looking for change. Do you give it to them? Well, if you don't, then you look like you're kind of stingy. And especially, you know, like you come up with some sort of justification. Well, you know, they're just going to spend it on, on liquor anyway. Or, um, you know, I gave to this guy last week. Um, on the other hand, if you give in too easily, maybe your lover, your, your, the person that you're, you're interested in, is going to judge you as being kind of a sucker, too, too soft, too easy. So you're in this quandary, what should I do, what should I do? And this can happen for a whole bunch of things. The, the waiter, you know, brings the stuff to the table, and they're kind of a jerk. Do you act the way you normally would to them, and maybe say something like, hey, nice personality, where'd you find it, you know? Or do you, uh, are you really gracious with them, because you want to appear like you're a really nice person to the person that you're, you're attracted to? And, you know, this can lead you into a lot of problems, can it? Because if you act too differently from the person who you really are, now you've got this appearance that you've got to keep up all the time when you're with this person. And if things work out, you're going to be with this person an awful lot of the time, aren't you? Have any of you ever seen this? I mean, we've seen this in, in shows and movies and, and things like that. You guys have seen this in real life, though, too. Some of you have probably experienced this. Um, and then after a while, the mask comes down. And then, you know, it can either be like, a, oh, I can't believe you're that kind of person. See you later. Or it can be, I'm so glad you finally felt like you could confide in me and show me that you actually, you know, are a slob. Or what else? Don't, don't complete your work on time. Or get mean sometimes and tell people off. Um, it can go a lot of different ways. But people are nervous about that. People are concerned about the opinion of the, the lover. And so this, this can actually bring out the best of us, can't it? I mean, is it a bad thing if people who are normally just average or even, you know, let's say below average when it comes to moral things, act like better people because they don't want their, their lover to, to think badly of them? What do you think? Good thing or a bad thing? Yeah. I think it's a good thing. I mean, sometimes behaviors like that become habits. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you, if you do something long enough, eventually it becomes part of who you are. One way of thinking about this, you put on the mask, and keep the mask on long enough, and pretty soon that'll become your face, because that, that's become the real you. We have movies about that, too, don't we? You know, the ennobling effect of love on 
this guy over here or this woman over here. Usually it's, it's more guys in, in movies, isn't it, than, than women, although it's starting to become a little bit more even. Um, sometimes we have ones where it doesn't work out at all, like Bridesmaids, you know, one of my wife's favorites, favorite movies. Great movie. Um, now, he, he comes up with something really interesting. This proposal that probably couldn't really work in, in any sort of military, even back in the ancient Greeks' time or in our time, but it's an interesting idea. Imagine uh, an <coughs> army or any sort of military force composed entirely of people who are in love with each other and who therefore are all trying to look good in the eyes of their lovers. They would be unstoppable compared to other sort of things that motivate people, like say money. A lot of people do fighting for money. You know, um, fighting for money is not going to buy you an awful lot of, of loyalty because at a certain point, you know, if things start to get really tough, somebody say, well, it's great to have money, but I don't want to die. I don't want to, to risk, you know, going into likely death um, just, just for the money. And even fear, I mean, you know, you can force people to go out and fight, but at a certain point they'll, they'll turn around and shoot you instead. Um, family connections, you know, pride, honor, all these sorts of things. They're not as powerful, bless you, as a motivator, Phaedrus thinks, as love, as this force of, of love. And it's kind of an interesting idea to think about, you know. Um, could you actually have something like this? How would that work? I mean, would each person be in love with each other person? I suppose that'd be the best way. But now, how would you pull off something like that? Um, probably have to come up with some sort of drugs. You know, everybody, they're all on something like a, uh, some weird mix of ecstasy and, and maybe something else that makes you aggressive because ecstasy tends to make people just you know, kind of touchy-feely. I don't know. I, I don't think that we have to worry about whether this could actually work because where is he going with this? Love makes us willing to sacrifice even our life. Somebody who truly loves is willing to make what we call the ultimate sacrifice. And he brings up some really interesting examples from Greek mythology. Um, he brings up, let's take the one with the failure, first of all, Orpheus. How many of you have ever heard of Orpheus? Not, 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 you know, from some, you know, anime thing or something like that, but the actual Greek work. There's a few, few. He was a musician. Um, such a great musician that when he would play, stones would stop rolling downhill to listen to him. And all the animals would come around uh, and, and just, you know, be totally still and, and, and pay attention to what he was doing. So he was sort of like the first rock star in his time. And later on, he actually lives kind of a rock star life because after he loses his wife, he's just followed around by these, these women everywhere who, who love his music, um, who eventually tear him to pieces. Um, not a good end for him. His wife dies, Eurydice, and he loves her. But he loves life a bit too much as well. He goes down to Hades to get her back. And the story is getting you know, left out a little bit. He doesn't go by himself. He takes Hercules with him. You guys have all heard of Hercules, right? The ultimate strong man in Greece. So he takes Hercules down there to hell with him. And Hercules makes a big mess out of everything until, fine, you can have her back. But they pull a trick on him. Um, because he went down into hell alive, he didn't die to go be reunited with her. They give him just a, a facsimile, a shadow, uh, or you know, a shade of her. And as she's going up, um, eventually he turns around and she's like receding back in there. He, he loses her. He, those who are not willing to sacrifice everything for love aren't worthy of getting their love back when their love has died. Now, Alcestis is a whole different ballgame. And Alcestis is a woman whose husband, um, Admetus, is told, and I don't remember the whole backstory on this, he's told, you're going to die. Um, here's a curse. You're going to die unless you can get somebody else to take your place. Now imagine you were in that sort of situation. The first people he goes to are his parents. He says, look, I'm going to die unless one of you is willing to die for me. Mom, Dad, what do you think? And they're like, yeah, 
He's like, you know, you're old already. I'm, I'm in the prime of my life, and you know, I am your kid. Can't you find somebody else? Can't you ask someone who, you know, maybe is even worse off than us? Because we, we only have a little bit of life left, but we want to have that life. So now he's, you know, really in a quandary. And his wife steps up and she says, I'll do it. You're going to have to take care of the kids. Um, and maybe we should talk a little, in the play, maybe we should talk a little bit about whether you're going to marry again after me. Or, but I'll do it. And uh, Euripides wrote, wrote a, a play about this, and it's, it's quite good. Um, things don't turn out well, as they never do in great tragedies. Um, but she's honored. Why? Because she is willing to make the ultimate sacrifice for the sake of her love. That shows how strong the motivation love is. The third example that he has is Achilles. Um, how many of you have seen the movie Troy? Any of you? Not too many? Um, I mean, it's better to read the Iliad than just to watch the movie. Um, but it's not a bad movie. <coughs> and um, in the Iliad, Achilles is in love with Patroclus. And Patroclus is actually older than Achilles. Um, now, Achilles is the best warrior that the Greeks had. And they have like a whole stable of great warriors. Ajax, Odysseus, Agamemnon himself is no slouch. Um, Telamon, and they're fighting against these Trojans, and the way that they'd fight is they'd go out and they'd stab each other with, you know, spears or swords or things like that. So it's very brutal. And Achilles is ticked off at Agamemnon, because Agamemnon, Agamemnon took um, this, this woman that he had as a captive, uh, I think her name is Briseis, takes her back, and, he, and so Achilles is like, I'm not fighting for you. Agamemnon is the, the commander-in-chief. So what you know what happens? Well, their their best guy is out. It's just like when you're you know if you have a sports team, and um, you know the, the first string quarterback is isn't there, or the best linebacker isn't playing. What happens? Things don't go that well, right? The Greeks are getting trounced. So Patroclus takes Achilles' armor and puts it on and says, "Well, I'll go out there and fix things. <laughs> you know, I'll go out there and I'll just look like Achilles. Put in you know an appearance." And what happens? He goes out there and he just gets slaughtered. Uh, Hector kills him. Hector is the great warrior on the Trojan side. So Achilles finds this out, and Achilles, this shows you how much he loved Patroclus, uh, he goes out and kills Hector. And then he mutilates Hector's body. And his, his dad actually has to come and beg for him to let it go, because Achilles is so, so angry now. Um, so actually, in some ways, it's not the best story. But what is Phaedrus getting at? Achilles... Achilles could have lived forever. He was half God on his mother's side. So if he didn't go out and avenge Patroclus or do other crazy things along those lines, he could live forever. So he chose to give up his potential immortality for, for death. And he did this. Why is he being so honored? He is the more beautiful one. He is the braver one. He's the stronger one. He's the one who should be loved more. Instead, he is willing to show love in, in battle, in valor, in all sorts of things. Interesting kind of, kind of idea, isn't it? Um, you know, something to think about. These are very uh, ancient and kind of uh, dramatic examples. What would be examples from our own time? Do you go and, and try to rescue the person who's drowning, even though it might result in you dying? Um, if you love them, would you even think about it? Would you have to think about it? Not if you truly love them, right? Or what if they need a kidney? It's not going to necessarily kill you, but it sure makes life tougher to only have one of them. Do you provide it to them? If you love them, Again, do you need to think about it? These are sort of examples that I think we can relate to. Do you put yourself in place of the, the other who's gotten themselves into a sticky situation that's probably going to be painful and take their place because you, you love them? Those are the sort of things Phaedrus is talking about. Um, let's look briefly now at Pausanias's.
Pausanias is going to say, that's nice, Phaedrus, but remember when I asked you a little bit earlier, does love always bring out the best in us? What would you say? What are, what are some ways that you have seen in real life that love does not necessarily bring out the best in us? Um, when people like murder their ex-lovers or something like that out of jealousy. Oh or... yeah, when they get they become obsessive stalkers, right? Um, and jealousy itself, even if you're in a relationship, he doesn't talk much about this, but but jealousy is a, a big problem, isn't it? Um, what else? Sometimes we don't always mean the same thing by love, do we? Don't people sometimes say, I love you, to try to get something out of other people? I mean, they, they may feel like they kind of love them at the time, but what do they really want? Yeah, they want to get they want to get late. They want to to you know get sometimes you know any any warm body will work right. So I'll love who there's that old uh, old song. If you can't be with the one you love, love the one you're with. You know, um, some people that's what it means. And so Pausanias says there is good love, and then there's bad love. He ties this in with um, a whole story about Aphrodite and whether Aphrodite is heavenly or earthly. Um, so there, there, there were actually several different origin stories for Aphrodite. In one, she's produced through sexual reproduction. You know, gods get together and they, they have kids. A lot of the gods came about that way. In another, she comes from Uranus. The, the primal sky god, um, one of the gods who's there at the very beginning, Uranus and Ge, have, Earth, have a whole bunch of kids. Those are the titans. And Kronos is the one who becomes the king of the gods by, because uh, Uranus was a bad guy. He was, he was just very, you know, crazy. He'll do anything. Um, he's like super barbaric. And Kronos actually castrates him. And, because that's one way to make sure that, you know, He's not going to mess with anybody anymore, and she, she, or he throws um, his stuff into the ocean, and Aphrodite comes out of the waves. That's what Aphrodite comes from. When Pausanias is saying from heaven born, that's that's what she actually, or that's what he actually means about her. Um, so you've got this contrast, and he ties it in with like this one being entirely male, and this one is sort of indiscriminately male and female. Um, what is he after in that? The real difference between these has to do with this being about the, the soul and this being about the, the body. So the soul or the intellect. And this, this brings up that issue of platonic love that, that was coming up earlier. What is it that we want from the, the body? First we, you know, we see physical beauty and we're attracted. And then what we want is sexual satisfaction. See so a beautiful body, we want to sleep with it. Yeah. What does that say body and body? Body, beauty, sex. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, my writing is not particularly legible, unfortunately. <coughs> it's getting worse and worse as I get older, too. Strangely enough. Um, probably some. So you don't write as much. Yeah, there's that. I should probably look in it. It might be some neurological thing. Uh, in any way, in any case, there's a difference between the body and the soul. And if, if the notion of the soul turns you off, think about personality. You know, that which is within and only comes out, how do you see a person's personality? Through their actions, through their words, through their attitudes. The body is really easy to see. The body can be made beautiful pretty, pretty easily too, can't it? Uh, makeup, you know, it's one way of doing that. Um, clothing, you know, clothing that actually fits well, makes a big difference. Um, working out, exercise, all those sorts of things, beautify the body. What if you want to beautify your soul? That's harder to do, isn't it? It's a bit tougher to change your, your personality. And some people have good personalities, and other people, you know, frankly, I mean, you know this to be the case, some people don't have good personalities, right? You wouldn't want to be with them in a relationship long term. 
They might be nice to look at, but you know, they're not they're not honest or generous. Or, you know, they're they're actually cowardly or you know, have various vices. So Pausanias says we need to distinguish between these two. A lot of times when love comes into disrepute, he says, when, it, when people look at it and they say love is a bad thing, they're thinking about this. And this isn't even entirely bad, it's just sort of random. Because the body is, is something superficial. And it can change very quickly. And people who are just into things for this, um, they're not looking at the, you know, the bigger picture, the more important phenomenon, the core of the person. People who are interested in this, they're more likely to have relationships that are going to last for a very long time. And notice too, with this sort of relationship, this is the platonic relationship, it's not about sex. It's not about getting off. It's not about satisfying a desire. It's about a developing intimacy with the person. Now you could ask, well, can't you have both? Wouldn't that be nice? And Pausanias doesn't seem to allow you to have both. Um, which, you know, is kind of a sad thing, but that, that's where he is with that. Um, what else does he tell us about, about this? Um, he tells us that there ought to be a law. There ought to be a law in Athens uh, that rules out acting on this sort of thing with young boys. Now, we could think about this in terms of young people in general. Why? And you know, in our time, we would usually say stuff like, well, they're, they're a young person, they can't give consent, right? Or, you know, there's something perverse about the older uh, person wanting to be with, you know, people who are, you know, quite young, maybe not fully developed. Um, there's something a little bit off about that, something skeevy. He says, well, that's all fine and good. But really, the big problem is, until somebody starts to develop, their soul and their soul shows, you got no idea what kind of person they are. Somebody might be quite attractive at, you know, say 12, but you know, you have no idea whether they're going to be a good person or a bad person. So it's better not to, you know, have that sort of affection directed at them at all. You know, somebody like Alcibiades would be a good case in point. Maybe Alcibiades would have been a better guy if he hadn't been so good looking. If uh, people had, you know, not said such nice things to him and given him gifts when he was when he was younger, um, and he he says um, a few other things. He says, what kind of people are likely to to ignore this? Well, people who are motivated by this kind of love. They're just looking for a warm body that happens to look nice. <coughs> you know, that fits their aesthetic. They're, they're tight. Um, they don't care whether the person is a good person. And it's probably not going to be that lasting of a relationship because once they actually get what they want, now suddenly you know, they've got a meeting the next day. Or you know, you've heard all these sort of, sort of excuses that you see in movies, right? Oh, look at the time. I, I think I've got to go feed the dog. Um, you know, they, they, they skip out of there. Now, he also talks about Greek city-states, and it's funny because it's sort of like a Goldilocks thing, you know, too hot, too cold, just right. Uh, Athens is just right. In some parts of Greece, the rural parts, all they know is this sort of thing because they're not very bright, and the lovers are allowed to do anything that they like, and basically it sounds like, you know, rape is allowed, um, which, which is not a good thing, right? Um, in Persia and places that are under the Persian yoke, they're at the other extreme, they rule that sort of thing out. Um, the Persians, by the way, were, were for the most part monotheists and, and probably had a lot more in common religiously with, say, Judaism than they did with the, the ancient Greeks, which might be one reason why you know, this sort of thing was coming up. Um, in any case, the Greeks saw it as the Persians just didn't like freedom. And if you can keep people from forming attachments, they'll be okay with, with tyranny. In Athens, we've got this weird hodgepodge of things. And on the one hand, it looks like it's okay to be having, you know, older, younger relationships. On the other hand, it looks like it's, it's not. Um, why? Well, you know, we let lovers get away with all sorts of stuff. And now think about our own society. If somebody can plead being in love, 
But don't we sometimes excuse asinine behavior that they engage in? So this is something you know that cuts across cultures. On the other hand, and this, is, this is something also quite interesting. Think about very permissive behavior. And now think about whether if you were a parent, you would want your kid mixed up in stuff like that. Like there's great interviews with, with you know, people who are making porn, for example, and um, you know they'll ask them, so would you let your daughter be in, in one of your flicks? And they're like, God, no. And then you're like, well, I thought you were all about freedom and everything goes and it's all A-OK, -okay, nobody's getting hurt. Well, yeah, this is my, my kid. So there's conflicting attitudes, right? There's, there's some sort of ambiguity there. Pausanias has an answer for that. He says, look, if you can stick with this sort of thing, then it's A-OK. -okay. The younger person can be involved with an older person in this sort of relationship. It's not going to be sexual. It's going to be what? More like a mentoring relationship. The younger person is hoping to learn something in the process, to become a better person, to acquire virtue and wisdom. If it's this sort of thing, then we should actually rule that out. We should, we should not allow that to take place between mature people and immature people because it's probably going to be bad for them, both, bad for both of them. And that's why we have this weird ambivalence in Athenian law. And we have some you know, sort of ambivalences like that in our own society when we start thinking about should older people be involved in romantic relationships with much younger people when it's a, an issue of maturity. So, you know, it's very different to say, should a 30-year-old be involved with a 14-year-old? And should a 40-year-old be involved with a 25-year-old? In the second case, hopefully they're both mature, right? We're more willing to say, yeah, I can understand that. The 30-year-old and the 14-year-old, maybe there really is a, an issue there. Unless it's going to be something that's not sexual. Where that's not, and it's not like, well, we're not going to have sex right now, but you know, so you turn 18, because that would still be this. If it's this sort of thing, this can develop into a, a lifelong friendship. 